You wanna hear something silly? Bears can't parallel park. You wanna hear something even sillier? Darwin thought that bears could turn into whales. Back in the 1800s, when Darwin first published The Origin of Species, this is exactly what he said. And he was brutally mocked by scientists of his day for thinking something so ridiculous. He even retracted the idea from later editions of his book. But here's the kicker. Scientists of today think essentially the same thing. <laughs> Stupid Darwin thinks bears could have turned into whales. How ridiculous. Everyone knows these wolf, pig, weasel, hippo things or it turned into whales. <laughs> My, how the tables have turned. Back in the 80s and the 90s, a series of fossils were found that rocked the evolutionary landscape. Paleontologists thought that they had found a clear transitional series of fossils documenting the evolution of whales. University of Chicago evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne says in his book Why Evolution is True, whales happen to have an excellent fossil record, courtesy of their aquatic habits and robust, easily fossilized bones. This is one of our best examples of an evolutionary transition. Wow, one of the best. Let's take a look at the story behind whale evolution. Is it a good argument or not? So according to Coyne, whale evolution is such great evidence since we have a chronologically ordered series of fossils. And it goes something like this. The sequence begins with a raccoon-sized animal called Endohyus, living 48 million years ago. 52 million years ago, we see a wolf-sized creature called Pachycetus, which is a bit more whale-like than Endohyus. At 50 million years ago, there's the remarkable Ambulocetus. Rhodocetus, 47 million years ago, is even more aquatic. Finally, at 40 million years ago, we find the fossils of Basilosaurus and Dorodon before we have our modern whales. Let's take a look a little bit closer at this chronologically ordered series of fossils. If you're paying attention, you might be thinking something fishy is going on here, but no, you'd be wrong. That would not be a bad pun because whales are mammals, not fish. But also, yes, something mammally was going on here. Granting the standard Darwinian dates for these fossils, Endohyus is dated as far younger than his supposed descendants. And he's not the only one, more on that later. This is common practice in evolutionary analysis to ignore where species actually show up in the fossil record and place them wherever makes Darwinian sense, creating what are called chronological inversions or ghost lineages. <gasps> oh, that's so spooky. The fossil record often reveals fossils out of the order that they're supposed to be in. For just a couple of other examples, let's take a look at bird evolution. It's supposed to go theropod dinosaurs evolving into birds, with the fossil Archaeopteryx being evidence of this as an intermediate fossil. But the problem is he appears long before the dinosaurs he was supposed to have descended from. Evolution also got a big stick in its spokes with this guy, Tiktaalik, a fish-like creature that was for years crowned as the smoking gun transitional fossil of fish starting to go from the sea to the land. Brilliant evidence, just what they expected. Until in 2010, fossil footprints of true tetrapods were found in Poland long before they were supposed to have evolved and all of a sudden Tiktaalik was dethroned as a transitional fossil because again, the dates are all out of order. Hey everybody, I'd like you to meet my grandpa. Oh, so cute. Is, is that his name or? No, his name is Seymour. He is my grandpa. What? Doesn't make any sense. Back to the chronologically ordered series of fossils, Basilosaurus and Dorodon are considered fully aquatic whales. They're not a transition to anything. Okay, maybe they're just trying to pad their numbers a little bit. Big deal. Surely the rest of the fossils are intermediate and transitional, right? Well, that depends on how you define intermediate. In paleontology, intermediate doesn't mean what we think it means. Like my parents are intermediate between me and my Gam Gam and Pop Pop. Oh, hello, sweetie. Hi, Gam Gam. Oh, my, how tall you've grown. Ah, but you're so skinny. Would you like your Gam Gam to make you a nice pot pie? You know, staying healthy. Is By intermediate, paleontologists usually mean a fossil is merely morphologically intermediate. In other words, if a fossil has features of a supposed ancestor and descendant, then it is classified as an intermediate or transitional fossil. But with that definition, I would be a morphological intermediate between this jockey and this professional basketball player. But that doesn't say anything about lineage, whether I'm an ancestor or descendant of either one. We could be completely unrelated or even chronologically out of order, that wouldn't matter. The very thing they're trying to prove, the ancestral relationship or how they came about, is pure assumption. 
This is how they can say there's tons of intermediate fossils and be technically correct. While at the same time, skeptics can say, yeah, there aren't really any intermediate fossils and also be correct. The fossil evidence is so meager that Darwinists, in order to prove evolutionary ancestry, they have to use a slippery definition that no one would accept in other areas of life. But for the sake of argument, let's ignore that problem because there's another one. Is there even enough time for the transition from land to water to hypothetically take place? Again, taking the standard evolutionary numbers for granted, we've got about 8 to 10 million years to go from the land mammal, Pachycetus, to fully aquatic whales. That sure seems like a whole lot of time. It's almost enough time for me to watch a Lord of the Rings marathon with someone who has a really small bladder. But is it enough time for whales to have evolved? The field of population genetics is devoted to calculating how long something like this would take. In the past, it was assumed that this was relatively simple to do, as easy as falling off a log. But more recently, scientists at Cornell University calculated how long it would take for different organisms to evolve two simple, beneficial mutations. For fruit flies, with their relatively large population sizes and speedy generation times, it'd only take a few million years for two mutations to become fixed. For larger mammals like humans, who have much smaller population sizes and longer generation times, they calculated it would take over 200 million years. Again, that's only for two beneficial mutations. Okay, so where would whales and their supposed ancestors fall on that timescale? They're not as quick to reproduce as flies, but quicker than humans. So for two simple beneficial mutations, that's supposed to take roughly 43.3 million years. So the evidence shows, using their own assumptions and calculations, that they don't even have one quarter of the time needed for even two simple mutations. And it takes quite a lot of changes to go from the land to the water, it turns out, including some of these lovely attributes. So, how many mutations does it take to change a pack of- Ooh, I know this joke. Three. One to hold it and two to turn the ladder. How many mutations does it take to change a Pachycetus to a whale? Hmm, not where I would have gone with that joke, but what do I know? To put that in context, take giraffes and their derpy little short-necked pals, the okapi. They're quite similar, and a recent paper studied their differences and found surprisingly 70 different genes that likely contributed to the giraffe's appearance. If animals that similar required 70 gene changes for basically just a longer neck and stronger heart, it's a pretty safe bet that animals as different as Pachycetus and whales would require at least as many, and more likely many thousands more. But it gets worse. Recently a new bacillosaurid fossil was found in Antarctica that, even using the most generous dates for Darwinists, cuts down the time available for the whale transition to about half of the already not enough time of 8 million years and could even place fully aquatic whales before Rhodocetus, before Ambulocetus and contemporary with, or even before Pachycetus, destroying the entire fossil timeline. So is the whale transitional fossil series any good? Well, once you take into account the padding of their numbers, the chronological inversions, the ghost lineages, more recent fossil finds that discredit the timeline, and their creative use of definitions for what it even means to be a transitional fossil, the mathematical problems using their own numbers, they're all very clever tricks. But once you see how all of this works, it's quite a bit less impressive. To be fair, scientists aren't doing this maliciously. <laughs> they really believe that evolution is just obviously true. So they reason, whether we have 8 million years or 4 million years, lots of fossils or no fossils. If evolution is true and we have whales today, then they must have been able to evolve, regardless of any problems that pop up. But if you don't presuppose evolution, if you treat it as a hypothesis rather than an assumption, then problems like these become far more difficult to hand wave away. So these fossil finds certainly are interesting and worth debating, but there's a lot more to it than the uncritical, glossy, one-sided story being told. If this is one of the best evidences for evolution, what does that mean for their other evidence that's not as good? Hmm. We got a couple of great responses to the video on whale evolution. If you haven't seen the original or the responses, links are in the description. They make a lot of claims that we got some things wrong, but let's look more closely and see if that's the case. 
First up, we pointed out that a temporal paradox existed with Pachycetus and Endohias. The response was that, these aren't a linear series, the temporal paradox isn't real, because the species last longer than individual animals. They would have overlapped in time. Yes, this is technically true, but also a little bit misleading. I know they're not claimed to be direct descendants, rare is the scientist who would be so bold as to make such a claim. Coyne says so much in his book, Endohias was not the ancestor of whales, but it was almost certainly its cousin. I'm merely following Coyne's argument. He's motivated to paint the evidence in the best possible light, the book is called Why Evolution is True for Crying Out Loud, and I use the dates that he provides. On the one hand, he'll admit this, but out of the other side of his mouth, he also asserts that they're chronologically ordered and tries to paint them as a sequence, starting with Endohias, then Pachycetus, and so on. Like I said in the original video, it seems like he's trying to pad the numbers. Someone not paying attention would get the impression that the evidence is more substantial than it really is. It's fine if you want to soften the claim, however, if you do, the argument loses its force. Next they say, the nested hierarchy of shared derived characters allows scientists to put the fossils in order. It's believed that they shared a common ancestor because they both have a similar inner ear bone, as well as some minor tooth features and bone density. This hardly seems to be a slam dunk though, the authors in the same paper acknowledge Characters identified as synapomorphies for cetacea in some of our most parsimonious trees include, and they list some characters, and then they say, all of these characters are found in some mammals unrelated to cetaceans. They don't in fact demonstrate common ancestry at all, rather they assume it and work back from there. This is a widely acknowledged starting presupposition about the data, not a conclusion from it. I may do a video on systematics in the future, but that is a much longer discussion. Next, they take issue with my statement that Darwinists ignore where fossils actually show up and place them wherever makes Darwinian sense. Nothing about the chronology, they say, contradicts the evolutionary relationship of the two species. And they say that apparently I know where Endohias is supposed to be. But Coyne himself says that the sequence begins with Endohias. It is less whale-like than Pachycetus. It should be first, but this isn't what the evidence shows. The expectation is that the cetaceans would begin as more terrestrial and less aquatic, and over time, they would become more aquatic and less terrestrial. The evidence of these two species does not support that conclusion. The evidence is explained away via ghost lineages. Coyne ignores where Endohias actually shows up and places it at the beginning of the sequence, where it makes more Darwinian sense. Exactly what I said. Next, this one is funny, they say that I'm making the, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys mistake. If Pachycetus came from Endohias, then why do we find Endohias at the same time as Pachycetus? No, more accurately it would be, if whale evolution is supposed to be great evidence because of this chronologically ordered series of fossils, then if the fossils are not, in fact, ordered chronologically, then is it still great evidence? I think that's a pretty fair question. Next, let's look at the Bacillosaurid fossil find. Now this one is important, he claimed that I used an outdated source from popular media rather than the more careful paper. He says that more recent analysis of the strata the fossil came from suggests that it's between 40 and 46 million years old rather than 49 million years old so that the timeline for whale evolution isn't really altered at all. It's true that the Bono paper points out multiple possible dates for the fossil and the researchers conclude that they preferred the youngest possible date range of 46 to 40 million years ago instead of the much older 49 million years ago initially reported. Let's look at their data and ask why they might have preferred the youngest possible dates. From their paper, they list multiple different studies. For the sake of argument, we're just going to take all of their numbers and methods for granted. Various geological dating methods are used and give ranges of possible dates. The more of these that we can put together, the better idea we can get of the supposed timeline. They first list a very broad Dutton study that has a wide range of about 55 to 46 million years ago, which is constrained further to 54 to 48.8 million years ago by the studies of Ivany and colleagues, Wren and Hart, Kokosa and Clark, as well as Harwood. Yet more studies, Douglas and Beale, support a range of Middle Eocene, specifically the early Middle Eocene boundary, according to Beale and colleagues. The data converges on the same number as originally reported in the date I used in my original video, 49 million years ago. In any normal situation, the preference in paleontology for reliable dates is to use the absolute dating over biostratigraphic dating anyway. However, the absolute dating is so unfavorable that they prefer to ignore the absolute dates and use a portion of the less reliable biostratigraphy dates that agree with their presupposition. And more recent studies than even those listed in the Bono paper confirm that the overwhelming number of studies using multiple lines of evidence, radiometric strontium dating, magnetostratigraphy, and biostratigraphy of different index fossil groups support the older date originally reported of 49 million years ago. The problem with where these studies converge is that it's far too early in a Darwinian model. Fully aquatic whales should not have lived that early. 
They chose the dates of 40 to 46 million years ago, not necessarily because that is where the data converge, it isn't, but because, as they say, it is more consistent with a published stratigraphic record of bacillosaurids elsewhere. In other words, their conclusions are being skewed by evolutionary presuppositions. This fossil still casts a huge shadow over the entire timeline, their overly optimistic conclusions notwithstanding. Next, let's take a look at Archaeopteryx. They say I've got a bad quote there. In the original it says, the small ciliosaurian dinosaurs related to Archaeopteryx. And I have that in brackets, theropods. Okay, is this a bad quote? Are the small ciliosaurian dinosaurs related to Archaeopteryx theropods? Yes, they are. They're a subgroup. There's nothing wrong with the quote or how I used it. Okay, well what about the more recent fossil finds that Jackson brings up? The paper he cites notably confirms the long-known temporal paradox with bird evolution. Yet, Archaeopteryx was still trumpeted for years previously in spite of this known difficulty. The shiny, one-sided story is presented to the public, and the legitimate controversy is hidden. That is, until they think they've solved it. Back to the point, the authors list a handful of fossils and say that these discoveries provide significant new information on avian origins. What Jackson doesn't disclose is that this is a highly controversial statement in paleontology. Avian evolution is fraught with phylogenetic uncertainty. It's a can of worms. Some authors consider these to be as bird-like or more bird-like than Archaeopteryx, while others consider the same taxa as less bird-like than even the Troodontidae and Deinonychosauridae. It is still a mess. Maybe I'll make a more in-depth video on it later, but the temporal paradox problems with bird evolution are hardly solved. Okay, what about Tiktaalik? They say that Tiktaalik was not dethroned as a transitional fossil because it was never considered a direct ancestor of tetrapods, even before these trackways were discovered. All the footprints showed was that the tetrapods or fishapods diverged much earlier than was previously evident. It's great that the initial paper was cautious in its claims for Tiktaalik and that scientists are willing to update things as more data comes in. This is what science is supposed to do, but it seems like Jackson is unaware of how Tiktaalik was presented and the importance placed on it by other prominent scientists. For just one example, Tiktaalik was such a huge deal precisely because it was supposed to be a prediction, when and where it was found stratigraphically, that was marvelously fulfilled in a stunning vindication of the evolutionary theory's predictive power, the most tangible evidence that evolution is true. It could have actually been a direct link in a true transitional form, and that it actually might have been your distant ancestor. One of the greatest fulfilled predictions of evolutionary biology. It was not only anticipated but predicted to occur in rocks of a certain age and in a certain place. Marvelous. But as it turns out, this is a failed prediction. As Luskin observes, when a widely touted prediction of evolution falls apart, evolutionists often rewrite history, soften the prediction, and claim that the harder prediction was never made in the first place. They often use slippery definition of terms to push their theory harder than the evidence allows, and then fall back to weaker arguments when the data contradicts their prediction. They also attack those who talk about the failure of this prediction as being ignorant of the true claims of evolution. This is known as moving the goalposts. Finally, let's look at the Durrett and Schmidt calculations. PZ claims that Michael Behe is a very bad mathematician. It's true that the Durrett and Schmidt paper was aimed at showing that Behe was wrong. I'm really glad that this was brought up. Yes, the Durrett and Schmidt paper attempted to disprove a model presented in Behe and Snoke's previous work. But ironically, they ended up strongly reconfirming the central thesis. The standard math of population genetics establishes the implausibility of Darwinian mechanism to produce what it needs to produce with the time and population resources that are available to it. Behe himself had to write a rebuttal in which he stated that the Durrett and Schmidt paper was, quote, seriously flawed, unquote. So it's seriously flawed when it annoys Michael Behe, but the Discovery Institute is happy to gloss over that part to cherry-pick conclusions they like from this seriously flawed paper. No, data was not cherry-picked. Their entire conclusion, as mistaken as it was, was granted. Behe called it seriously flawed because it contained serious flaws. Durrett and Schmidt themselves acknowledged as much in their reply to Behe. First, correcting for a simple oversight of using the incorrect mutation rate, then correcting for their neutral rather than deleterious model, because again, the empirical data suggests the intermediate mutations are not neutral or harmless, and adjusting for the effective rate of the second mutation and their inappropriate multiplication of probabilistic resources, their calculations were off by more than seven 
orders of magnitude. When correcting for these errors and others, their model agrees quite well with the original paper by Behe and Snoke, as well as the empirical public health data in the literature. Next, they accuse Dirt and Schmidt of calculating the waiting time far too narrowly. They don't model how evolution actually works, because humans and fruit flies have lots of places in the genome where beneficial mutations can take place, which increases the odds substantially and shortens the waiting time as a result. But no, in fact, Dirt and Schmidt are right in how they modeled it. This is the proper way to estimate the power of Darwin's mechanism, because almost all possible single or double or triple mutations amongst sequence space will be useless. It would be silly to think that just any two mutations in general would be adaptive. The vast majority are completely ineffective or degradative. This is why they chose to model it so specifically. So this is not like a specific individual winning the lottery. That's a gross misunderstanding of the model. For a more full treatment on this, see the notes below. And finally, a 2005 paper that purports to shred Behe and Snoke's calculations. This one is pretty simple. The authors wrote a reply answering Lynch's paper, and in it, Behe and Snoke write, Our model posited necessary intermediate mutations to be deleterious in the unduplicated gene. Lynch's model assumes them to be neutral. All of his objections to our work stem from this difference. Experimental studies contradict Lynch's assumption of complete neutrality as a rule. The majority of amino acid substitutions decrease protein function. They go on to explain other incorrect things with Lynch's paper, but that's the gist of it. So much for shredding their calculations. The whale series is claimed to be one of the best lines of evidence for neo-Darwinism. We gave two arguments why whale evolution is actually quite weak. Number one, population genetics calculations say there isn't anywhere near enough time for even minuscule amounts of coordinated mutations to take place, even granting all the time that they claim. It just couldn't have happened that quickly. Weak responses have been made here and there, but they all misunderstand the population genetics calculations. Check out the previous video for more information there. In number two, a fully aquatic whale fossil was recently found that predates nearly the entire fossil series, leaving even less time than before. I supplied a survey of relevant papers to show that there's a strong consensus dating the fossil. Now we got a response from Jackson Weed that claims I made some mistakes with the dating of the fossil. Let's take a closer look and see if that's really the case or if Jackson is the one who made the mistakes. And if you like these kinds of videos, make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you can get notified when a new video is released. Let's get started. In the previous video, I included this chart laying out the dates for the fossil in question and again, granting for the sake of argument all the methods and all the dates as they stood. I said the date originally reported of 49 million years ago, giving the whale series little to no time to take place. Jackson argues that a much younger date better fits the data, which allows for more time for the series to evolve. First up, we have this Dutton study from 2002. Jackson claims that I should have included both data points as well as the error bars in the graph for both of the shell samples from Telm 5. For the sake of argument, if we wanted to add the error bars, it would look like this. A couple of problems with that though, he's misread the chart. There are not two samples from Telm 5, in fact, as Jackson mistakenly says. Their chart includes a single shell with multiple possible dates, the average of which is 46 million years ago, the same date that I have in the chart originally. There were multiple shells that converged on the same data point for the high end of 55 million years ago and a single shell with multiple possible ages on the other end. That's why the data was represented the way it was. Jackson just misread the chart. But to avoid squabbling about error bars, we'll simplify it to somewhere between Telms 2 and 5 where this fossil was actually found. Next up, the Ivany paper from 2008. We literally use the numbers exactly from the Bono paper. It includes why they chose a range over the specific value for Telm 4. Next up, this group of three papers from Ren and Hart, Kokoza and Clark and Harwood. The Bono paper says that an early Eocene age is supported by all of these, which would look like this. If someone doesn't like this analysis, then the problem is with Bono and colleagues, and not me. This is pretty much exactly what my chart showed. Jackson makes another mistake quite frequently throughout his video by assuming that when Bono et al. refer to the lower part of the Lamaseta formation, they're excluding Telm 4, where the fossil was found. But just a few sentences before, they clearly specify that Telm 4 is included in the lower part of the Lamaseta formation. The dates provided by these papers aren't merely providing an upper bound as he claims, they're specifically used to date the rocks the fossil was found in. This mistake is why his chart is off by so much when compared to the data reported in these papers. Looking at the specific data from Wren and Hart, Jackson says that their samples from section 3a roughly corresponds to Telm 2 and 3b corresponds to Telm 5. Actually, he makes another mistake here. Their 3a indicates samples from both Telms 2 and 5, which is early Eocene, Eprisian. Exactly what Buono said and what I had in the chart. Specifically, Ren and Hart indicate the latter 36% or so of the Eprisian. In their 3b indicates the higher up strata, Telms 5, 6, and 7, which date to the middle or late Eocene. Jackson is wrongly trying to apply the dates from much younger strata to this fossil. 
Kokoza and Clark. Jackson notes that this paper's figure 2, measured section represents the basal 168 meters of Lamaseta formation. Assuming they started at the base of Telm 1, that would mean they only sampled Telms 1 and portion of 2. The problem is this study doesn't include any Telm labels. This formation is quite large and different studies begin and end their measurement ranges in various places. So the question is where does their chart line up? Jackson says way down here, but the stratigraphy doesn't even come close to lining up. The base of Telm 1 is a very simple conglomerate in siltstone composition. No burrows, no slumps, etc. Quite different than what is charted by Kokoza and Clark. A much better fit of the stratigraphic features would be somewhere higher up in Telms 2 through 5, which also happens to be what Bono indicates as the basal portion of the formation. Next up, Jackson says of Biol 2013 that it doesn't directly provide an age of anything. They do though. The Bono paper lists five dinocyst species that characterize the lower strata which Bile dates, and Jackson ignores all but the youngest sample, but we'll include them below. We've got 45, 65, 55 and a half, 58.2, 53.9. Of all of these, I took the most favorable dates for Darwinists of 45 million years ago. Even though multiple other papers have Aniodoxista dictyostela's first occurrence far earlier, specifically 49 million years ago, the exact date originally reported. So much for me skewing the data as early as possible, as he claims, I'm really trying hard to be fair and use the dates as they are, granting as much as I can, even passing over much older dates to provide more favorable results for the Darwinists. Next up we have the Douglas paper from 2014. This one is a doozy. I was unsure of it before, so I didn't mention anything and use their dates as they stood. However, after looking into it more thoroughly, Douglas seems to be making a pretty big mistake. And then that mistake is repeated by the Bono paper as well as Jackson. The Douglas paper says that their assignment of roughly 45 million years ago is based upon two pieces of evidence. The first of which is the first occurrence of Aniodoxista dictyostela, which is dominant in these sediments, has been calibrated to Cron C20R roughly 45 million years ago. Checking on those two references, they don't actually say that. Douglas simply misread them. They actually say that this specimen dates to Cron C21, not C20, which means their entire basis for dating this far younger than everyone else is wrong. Bono presumably copies their error without checking, as does Jackson. Even the secondary claim that these date to 49 million years ago or younger is playing fast and loose with the data. The paper they referenced actually says 50 million years ago, and many of the transantarctic flora date as far older. Next we have Brinkhouse, 2003, Williams, 2004. Jackson again incorrectly states that these papers only set the upper age for Telm 2 and don't include Telm 4 where the fossil was found, and again he's mistaken. Bono cites them as supporting a date near the early middle Eocene boundary, which is what I have in the chart, that's roughly 49 million years ago. Finally, we have Bion, 2011. Jackson says that this isn't directly dating the Lamaseta formation, and that it only places an upper bound on the base of the formation of 49 million years ago. But again, no, he continues to make the mistake of excluding Telms 4 and 5 from the base of the formation. All of these papers include them, and they are part of the basalmost section of the formation. And according to this paper, transantarctic flora occurred around the early middle Eocene boundary, roughly 50 million years ago. Again, which is what I have in my chart. There was one additional relevant paper that Bono cited, Kemp 2014, that I overlooked in the last video. They also say that Telm 4 is roughly 52 to 51 million years ago, far older than what Jackson and Bono would prefer. Again, we've only looked at the papers that Bono cited, and as careful as their work was, they are trying to push the youngest possible date. Are there any other papers that could weigh in on the question of the proper age for this fossil? Yeah, there's lots. Very few paleontological studies accept the younger Middle Eocene age for the Lamaseta formation. The overwhelming majority of evidence from different fields, micropaleontology, mammal bile stratigraphy, radiometric dating, paleomagnetic data, marine transgressions, they all converge on the older date. To avoid the accusation of citation bluffing or piling on, I'll just provide nine recent papers that support the consensus for the date of Telm 4, where this fossil was found. Marinci, 2006, lowable eustatic low stands, and they pin it at roughly 49.5 million years ago. Regaro and colleagues, 2013, they say early Eocene Eupressian, 49 to 52 million years ago. Gelfo, 2014, mammal biostratigraphy, 52.8 million years ago. Cenizo and colleagues, 2015, 49 to 52.8 million years ago. Engelbrecht, 2017, Telm 4, specifically 52.5 to 51 million years ago. Gelfo, 2017, 52.8 million years ago, that's mammal biostratigraphy. Doug Jove et al., 2017, Eprisian, 56 and 47.8 million years ago. Marama and colleagues, 2018, late Eprisian, that's roughly 49 million years ago. And finally, from 2020, Davis and colleagues, Telm 4 is 52.8 to 49 million years ago. 
If we overlay all the dates, we get a very interesting picture. The date that was originally reported and included in my video of 49 million years ago is strongly supported by the preponderance of evidence, and if anything, that date is too generous. An even older date is very well supported. Buono and Jackson try to make the case that the data supports a far younger age way out here. Unfortunately for them, the data in this case isn't cooperating. Again, the story being portrayed is vastly different than the reality of the situation with whale evolution. It might just be time to retire the whale series as evidence for neo-Darwinism. I was surprised that uh, the skull wasn't more complete. I thought you had this full, because I've always seen the models in the museums yeah. of the full skull. Did How did you figure out the, what the shape of the skull? Uh, was it based on these bones or did you have other fossils to go from? So the shape of the skull is uh, based on the fossils that we have. And so we have the parts that have the eye and the brain case and the back of the snout. We don't have the tip of the snout which is unfortunate because we don't know where the nasal opening was, therefore. However, we did find the whole lower jaw, so we do know how long that snout was. We don't have a sense for its exact shape. So that's based on uh, related animals. Those related animals all have the nasal opening way in the front, so those related animals would be Cuchicetus and Pachycetus. Those have their nasal opening way in the front, so it's likely that Amulocetus had that too, but we don't know that. When this video series was being filmed on location at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, the executive producer noticed a discrepancy between museum drawings of Rhodocetus and the fossils. The reconstruction of Rhodocetus had a whale fluke, but there were no fossils of the tail to confirm this. Dr. Phil Gingrich, the scientist responsible for the discovery and reconstruction of Rhodocetus, was questioned how he knew there was a whale fluke on Rhodocetus since that part of the fossil was missing. What was the uh, reasoning that uh, the scientists think there was a fluke on Rhodocetus um, based on the other pieces of anatomy? Well, I told you we don't have the tail in Rhodocetus. So we don't know for sure whether it had a ball vertebra indicating a fluke or not. So I speculated it might have had a fluke. Scientist Gingrich also acknowledged that the flippers were drawn on the diagram without these fossils. Now, he does not believe this animal had flippers. Again, his answer was surprising, since the museum diagrams had flippers on Rhodocetus. Now since then, we've found the forelimbs, the hands, and the front arm, the arms, in other words, of Rhodocetus. And we understand that it doesn't have the kind of arms that can be spread out like flippers are on a whale. And if you don't have flippers, I don't think you can have a fluke tail and really powered swimming. And so I now doubt that Rhodocetus would have had a fluke tail. Many experts consider whales to be the best fossil evidence for evolution, but are unaware of these discrepancies.
1859, Darwin speculated that bears evolved into whales. But does this story hold water? Secular scientists support Darwin's hunch with two main arguments. One, fossils, and two, useless features, also known as vestigial features. They claim that fossils show a clear evolutionary progression from land mammals to whales. But many of these fossils are incomplete. Take the famous fossil Pachycetus. Scientists first found an incomplete skull, and it didn't even have a body. Later, a more complete Pachycetus discovery revealed perfectly normal legs. Pachycetus lived on land. Or Rhodocetus. At first, with only one head, spine, and a few other bones, secular scientists imagine it had front flippers and a whale tail. But just like Pachycetus, later discoveries revealed that it was just a land-dwelling mammal. Sadly, some museum illustrations still show whale tails on Rhodocetus. Without Pachycetus or Rhodocetus, the main missing links vanish from whale evolution. So, we have whale kinds or land mammals, but nothing in between. Secular scientists often point to vestigial features as evidence for evolution. They assumed that certain whale hip bones were useless legs left over from land mammals evolving into whales. Come to find out, those bones play a pivotal role in helping whales reproduce. They aren't useless at all. The most complete scientific evidence refutes Darwin's hunch. Instead of transitional fossils and useless features, we find fully formed creatures according to their created kinds.